Welcome back. This is part two of a two-part series featuring speakers from the 2024 Women's Homestead Society Conference. In this video, we interviewed Anna Seda Scott of A Farm Girl in the Making, Sean and Beth Doherty, authors of The Independent Farmstead, and Jenna Chando of A Heritage Life. Let's see what they have for us. So now I'm here with Anna Seda Scott from, well, originally she was a farm girl in the making, but I think you kind of outlived a farm girl in the making. I think you are a farm girl. Oh, no, no. I'm working on all that. I'm working on all that. Yes, <laughs> definitely working on it. And it's, it's such a privilege to be able to talk to you, but I have a couple of questions yeah. to ask you. Yeah, ask away. Let's go. <laughs> Give so them to me. Number one, if someone is new or wanting to get into growing their own food, homesteading, farming, whatever, then... What advice would you give them? It can be a little intimidating. It is. My first advice is to find a mentor that knows exactly what they're doing and glean off from them. That's important because there's so many people out there that can actually teach you along your journey. Mm -hmm. If not, find people who can, even if it means going through social media, if it's um, someone in your county, someone in your city, um, the extension office, or just going through a website that you find that you resonate with, I would definitely reach out to them and see if they offer any hands-on workshops, whether it's online or in present, and then go from there and then pick a skill that you want to master and then move on to the next skill from there. I think that food preservation is a big thing for people, but it's one of those things <laughs> where your garden is going to be lucrative to you and you've got to know how to store it. So mm -hmm. I would say pick a skill, learn the skill, add a skill, and then keep going from that point. I would look for vegetables on sale. Absolutely. Like tomatoes on sale yeah. and learn how to, yeah. first thing I learned how to can was salsa. Oh, salsa is a staple in fruit, but it's can freak. It should so be. Salsa is great. It's mm -hmm. very fabulous. We mm -hmm. go through a lot of salsa a year, but I will tell you that it's really, really important that you really understand the science behind it. If you, mm -hmm. you know, you have to know that science can marry traditional, but you have to understand that science behind it. Um, you know, just, just fine tune it, own it. And then from there, continue the learning process. It changes every single year. And so it's, it's a, that's an important part of aspect of homesteading is to continue educating yourself. You just don't know it one time, you know it all the time after that. And I, excellent. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. This question is a little bit different. We're getting older. Mm -hmm. We won't say how much older. <laughs> Our gray will speak for itself. Right there. But this lifestyle of growing food, whether it's gardening, getting up and down off the ground, oh, eating, yeah. chasing chickens, I mean, chasing yeah. chickens, it has a lot of physicality to it. So older people may be a little intimidated by that. So what advice would you give them? Well, take what you can handle. Basically, take what you can handle. Right now, if it's gardening for you, learn how to garden your raised beds versus directly into the soil. Turn around and, you know, if you're going to process chickens or process birds, you do them in batches that you can actually handle. Don't come in and try to do 50 or 100 of them. If you can only handle 10 a day, process 10 a day. It may take you three days to get through it, but the point of it is that it's done. You own your food source and you're moving on from there. So I would honestly tell you, age will only play a factor if you allow it to. You're going to have aches and pains. I pulled my back the other day and I'm here limping because I tried to pick up a hog, the gravity hog feeder, while it had a feed in it. And so Jess is like, don't touch that. I'm like, I got it. Oh, I just pulled my back. You were but thinking, you were thinking right, you were still dirty. I was going to be good, <laughs> right? I got muscles. I'm going to do this. But take everything as you can every single day. Wake up. Make a plan. Yes. Do it. Don't exert yourself because it takes us longer to recover from things than yeah. we did in our 20s and 30s yeah. at this point in time. So with that said, when you do this, do it smart, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to bend over a raised bed. Put your raised bed up higher. Turn around and process 10 chickens instead of 50 a day. You know, if you're going to can, can what you want. Get a refrigerator unit and store everything else in and take one canning process at a time. That's yeah. still going to be good if you keep it cool. So just take it slow. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a race. It's going to get done. And the key point of it is, is just keep it in your mind that you're going to keep going and keep doing. Our body needs to move, right? And then we go from there. Yeah, definitely. And it doesn't have to be expensive. No. I, I used to think raised beds have to be really expensive, which yeah. they do. 
but I've learned, I have videos on how to like fill. There you go. With, with dirt that you got from the forest. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We have some of the best compost block dirt behind our barn. So yep. I will tell you, just, just take it slow. It's not a race. It's yes. going to get done and you're going to be okay doing it. Don't kill yourself in the process. And because, still get mentors. Yeah. And still get mentors or actually go ask the FFA or the ag students if they want community service hours community. to come help you do this. Because then you've got, you've got the youth behind you. You get the yeah behind you, the muscle men. Yeah, that. that's, that's a great idea. idea. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea too. Yeah. I'm... Two last questions, I promise. Okay. Number one, what is your favorite livestock to raise? Hogs. Hi. Don't tell my milk cows that though. <laughs> but hogs, I love raising hogs. I don't know what it is about hogs because we farrow on our property, yeah. and so when you see these fresh little piglets come out and they're nursing and they're crazy and they're spastic and they're funny. You know, but they've gotten out. We've had to chase them back in, all that stuff. But there's something about a hog raising that I love. And maybe it's because we still have our pasture with our hogs in the woods mm -hmm. and we get to watch them take care of the natural environment. They till my garden for me. They will till any space that I have. They're a great protein source. And then on top of that, I don't have to worry about offering any waste on my property because my hogs get them. Table scraps extra milk, extra eggs. So I don't even sell milk anymore. It all goes to my hogs that we're not using them yet. Oh yeah. They're still like this they can, in the recycling bin. Can, and to buy it. Absolutely. Yeah. And hogs. Hogs hands down. That's what I love. <laughs> I love my hogs. <laughs> don't tell my dairy cows though, but I love my hogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, true. And the second one is what's your favorite vegetable to raise? I love leafy greens. So I love collards, kale, Swiss chard. I love it all because I love basically just sauteing it in garlic mm -hmm. and then or lard and then from there I actually love it in soup I love it blended I love kale chips I love all that stuff and I'm really sad that we only get it twice a season so I try to save as many leafy green pucks and can as many leafy greens as possible because I love leafy greens if I had to pick a close second, to be honest with you, with artichokes, we just now put in five artichoke plants. I got seeds to start some more, and it's a one-shot deal, but it makes me happy to eat them. Uh, I don't know why, but it really makes me happy to eat them. So leafy greens, even lettuce, even spinach, um, and then on top of that, artichokes a second. I know you didn't ask for a second, but I gave no, it to you anyways. Sometimes there you go. It's just close enough. Yeah. But I thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. I hope I hope you guys gain some knowledge and insight from that. I hope so too. Now you have a book. I do. It's the Farm Girl's Guide to Preserving the Harvest. Um, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it at any online bookstore. I saw um, Tractor Supply, Supply yeah, yeah. Cabela's. So pick it up, grab it. It's the A to Z to food preservation. If you are a beginner or you're ready to transfer from one phase to the next, it's completely ideal for you. Um, it's just going to guide you along your journey to help you get to the point of true food freedom and truly putting up the harvest the way that we are intended to do. Excellent. Well, thanks again. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm here with Sean and Beth Doherty from the Sow's Ear Farm out of Ohio. Some of you may recognize them, and for you that don't, they've been doing this for how many years did you tell me? 27, like 30. 27 on our home farm and 38 together. And so we can't. Uh, that's cool. So y'all have been doing it way before homesteading was a thing or cool. It was freakish. I would like to ask you two questions. The first question is for people that are watching, who well, you maybe want to learn how to grow their own food and they're just starting this order. It can be a little intimidating. What advice would you give to them? Well, there's a couple of things I would say. One is um, I always, when, I, when we sign a book, I always say farm with reckless abandon. You just, you just have to jump in. Uh, don't let things intimidate you. Uh, just jump in where you are. And, and then the second thing that I would say, I know that it can be intimidating but if you really want your R to start off with with jet fuels, with with what will make it work, you have to start off with a dairy cow. Uh, people jump in with chickens, and then it is now I've got to get feed. Now I've got to do all these things, and now I'm I'm behind the eight. But if you start off with a cow, and it's not as intimidating as you think, especially if you have a good dairy. 
dairy cow because they are they are pets. They are pussy chaps. They are. We're not scary big elk. Okay. You have all. You're starting with that food that you already have on your farm, which is grant. That's what you need to do, because if it means that I've got to buy a cow, but after that, it's free. It's free. Real bill free. Don't y'all say you feed them with sunshine? Absolutely. Feed them with sunshine. And you're feeding yourself, so that when I'm drinking that milk, it's yesterday's sunshine that I'm drinking. Questions. I really agree with Sean. I think. I think the thing I would add to that is, one, don't be intimidated if all you do is plant a tomato and make sure the weeds don't eat it. And then when the tomatoes happen, get them and eat them. That's, you're already making the step toward having some understanding of and participation in the, the natural processes that put food on your table. You're eating, and right now you're eating by Proxing, you're, you're letting somebody else do all that work for you. You can begin to enter into that, take ownership of it, feel comfortable with it, feel um, adequate for taking on more of it. If you just grow something and eat it. And then the other piece I would just emphasize is he said, all life is sunlight. Everything that lives, lives because the sun is falling on the ground and something's photosynthesizing it. A farm is a place where people take an ecosystem if working just fine without them it's growing whatever it's growing that land is cycling sunlight nutrients just by sunlight nutrients and rainfall get out in it that a farm is all we did people has come that to an ecosystem make intelligent observations about how it's working and then begin to make it do the one thing it's not doing that we want it to do which is make people food and the most direct way we can do that number one first day this is what we're going to do it now Starting over, she would bring it in an animal that can eat what your hand is already growing. And it's right. If you're if you didn't buy deep woods and if you did, let's have a talk later. Email me, but that's <laughs> probably not where you want to store hunts didn't. But if you if you didn't buy deep woods, some kind of non woody green growing stuff covering the ground and there is a ruin it that is that the cow, sheep, goat. Bring in the animal that will eat what you're already growing. Milk that animal, then you have food for people. And we started this ecosystem without disrupting it, without shutting down its systems. We started it producing feet in the air. This is a nearly as intimidating as it sounds. I really like what you guys are saying. So for our older viewers, who well, maybe you're starting this for the first time, have never grown up with it, never done this before. It could be really intimidating because there's a lot of physicality to growing your own food. Do you have any specific advice for them Yeah, they start? The thing I would say to them is um, partner with someone younger than you. Uh, we, we love the multi-generation farms that we're beginning to. We, we go out and, and do farm codicil, and we see that the parents are partnering with this, the children, especially the older children, been saying loud and farm together. Oh my God. They now have, uh, you know, it's oftentimes the older people are bringing money to the table, which the younger people don't have, and the young people are bringing the energy, which the younger people may or may not have. So the part and our partnership really work, and uh, it's, 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 how, it's how people used to live. Pop Hollis? We're simply saying, let's act like human beings. Yeah, let's right. Act yeah, like human manly beings. than human beings. On down to that, I would just say that we have worked over the years with a good many older couples. By older, I mean older than us. And we're 60 and 64 at the moment. And um, I think I often thought, you know, in the beginning, I'd think, oh, I don't, I don't know if this people were going to be able to do something worth it. And we go back to this fall, so we find these 65 and 70 year olds with a dairy cow milking um i'm not saying it's there's not a it's alley if it's a certain um i don't want to say risk but there's like a certain cusp you have to push past that point where you're uncomfortable where you think i'm gonna do this before maybe i'm gonna get hurt as sean said dairy cows are dairy cows in part because they like people they're domesticated they don't want to kick you. They don't want to hurt you. If you have a dairy cow that kicks you in it repeatedly, probably not a good dairy cow. You sell it, or eat it, and get a different dairy cow. But um, it's possible for an older license to make this time. I would also 
urge that person to go pretty uncomfortable to partner with. I fall because when you write to the ER at three o'clock in the morning because somebody has kidney stones, you want to know somebody's still at home or in the neighborhood to milk it. Yeah? <laughs> Last question. Yeah. Last of three, two questions. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. The third of two questions. <laughs> I got that with dessert too. The third of my tune desserts. <laughs> that works. So, what is, I think I know the answer to this question. What is your favorite livestock to raise? Favorite livestock to raise? Mm, I guess. I guess it would have to be dairy <laughs> cows. But... Dairy cows, hands down. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and remember that dairy cows are beef cows. If you're a boy, you don't make milk, you're going in the freezing. That would be. Would be yep. That type of but pigs are quick, a close second because I love you, poor child. And that's because if you have a dairy cow three days later, you need a pig. That's right. This is true. I I would wholeheartedly agree with you. I would just from having our own pigs, I agree. And the other thing is, what is your favorite prop or vegetable to raise? Well, I'm very Irish, and potatoes are are my are my food. So we raise probably about a ton and a half of Great. potatoes a year and that will keep us in potatoes eating potatoes right three it, times three it, times it, a day over the wild potato because you can have them baked sliced uh every other way and then my daughter recently has been doing twice baked potatoes where she but <laughs> she put sour cream and sour cheese oh, all from the mushroom. sour cream butter Jason. oh my god <laughs> my god so potatoes now are just a vehicle for all these wonderful foods <laughs> so in any event potatoes I guess sir. What? I would add a little technical background to that in that potatoes will grow in the widest variety of climates and soils. They'll produce more food per acre than anything but corn. They'll produce more protein per acre than corn. Not more than beans, but she cut their way off. I don't know all this stuff. <laughs> but that there's so much food produced by potato plants. Your best bet if you need a staple crop is of wheat, is it corn? But it's potato, just in general. And, and the wonderful They're, thing about it is that they grow. And they store passively 12 months. And they'll right. keep your husband very happy. That's right. That's right. So they harvest in July, and we're still eating our last year's potatoes in July when we harvest our net potatoes. Also, and then all the surplus goes, gets fed to the pigs and turns a little bit. And she grain. pointed at me. <laughs> now, you get the new potatoes and the white cubes get the old potatoes. My favorite vegetable crop is going to be tramontino, which is a hard inch squash. It's really big. It's really delicious. It stores really well. Five foot long for for a fruit, right? It stores really well. It will literally store from when we harvest it in September to right now. Uh, I have some in the basement. It's, 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 it's yep. great pig food. It's a super delicious. You can eat it as a green squash when it's young and green. It will ripen and become a winter squash and store for a long time. And um, so being frugal farmers subsistence farmers sounds like maybe we're also shoestring farmers we eat like royalty three times a day right in that but we do often eat the same things over and over again because that's what the land produces season a little bit differently perhaps or made a little bit differently yeah, but lots of ways of they tomatoes and hamburgers and potatoes and me you know, any our chops at the bay. We, we grow greens three, 12 months of the year. Um, so there's always green stuff, and there's always squash, and there's always and it, other things, but those are our staple. But we, but we sit down to eat that every yeah. night, and then we eat the doctors for lunch, we leave again the next day. And everybody at the table, still sad. We've been doing it for all, their whole lives, and we said, we got this is so yeah. good. It's not just a, a, a an appreciation. Oh yeah, this is good. No, a deeply appreciative moment with every meal. This food is so good. Who knew that God intended food to be that delightful all the time? Right. What a source of joy for humanity in our day to day lives when our food is so unhealthy. Water. <laughs> our food is so well mineralized. Is so nutrient tight. Is so just dang delicious. Yeah. That it is a happiness, it is a joy just to eat. So, potatoes is good. So, just to address that a little bit too, there's something also deeply satisfying in participating in the Creator's creation. 
being a part of that whole process, it's, it's so fulfilling to sit down. I know for me, when I've served something on a table, it's like, David and I, we bred this rabbit or bred this, this chicken or whatever. And we raised it and we took care of it. And when we dispatched, it was fast. It was ethical. And now it's feeding my family. And it's even that taste makes it taste so much better. Right. You know, right. it's, and, it's, and one of the things that I think really folds our family together is that everybody in the family is participating. The children are participating in all the stages of this, the cooking, the, the harvesting, the planting, the whole thing. And it's, it really is a bonding. I thought that you said participating in the creator's creation because if you can read, you can read chapter one or two of Genesis. You doesn't realize this is, this wasn't a, you know, this is what like the Lord said. By the way, until you figure out how to build machines, you're going to have to corn. He said, let us make man in our own image so that he may have dominion over us. It says, we're made in his image so that. But our, our participation in this creation mm-hmm. is the enactment of our being in Hesiliath. And so when we farm, oh, I can't. we enact our humanity. And what is the joy of God? A human, much fully love. Our pen. And it wasn't a suggestion. I mean, this was a call. This, it was, was, it was amazing. this is your job to raise your thing. And to proxy that out, we find uh, is makes you less human. That's what we're... Well, I certainly thank you both for your time. I know your time is valuable. Appreciate everything you've been talking about. And if you are interested in learning more, they have a great book called The Independent Farm Set, which I highly recommend that goes into greater depth about some of the things that they were talking about. So, Sean and Beth, thank you very much. So much. It was a pleasure. And thank you for what you do. I'm here with Jenna Chando, and she specializes in herbals. So, Jenna, I have a, a question for you. Yeah. So, I know this year coming up, this growing season, my son and I want to get really involved with herbalism and start learning a lot. What advice do you have for my viewers that are also like me, maybe wanting to get into not just culinarily, but also medicinally using herbs? What advice do you have for us? Yeah, so I actually have two. The first one is start slow. Pick three herbs, learn them really, really well. Plant them, grow them, work with them. Take the growth and the knowledge and turn it into practical application so that when the time arises and you actually need to use those remedies, you feel very, very comfortable going to your medicinal apothecary cabinet, pulling it out and utilizing it because you now not only have the wisdom, but you have those practical application skills from start to finish. So that would be my first um, tip is do absolutely everything you can with it. Grow it, um, harvest it, dry it, tincture it, make salves, make teas, all of the things that you can do with these plants to get a really wide breadth of knowledge on each one and then continue to add to your herbal repertoire. The second thing, and I think it is the most important part, is to make sure you find a good mentor somebody that you can ask your questions the internet is great but there is such a wide expanse of knowledge and such a wide expanse of information that this site says this this site says something different this site says something different this site says something different what's right well herbalism is one of those things where none of them are necessarily wrong Mm -hmm. it's just different approaches we've all learned from different people we have different styles. We've got Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, and then there's our more modern herbalism. So find yourself a mentor or two. I have a mentor who specializes in traditional Chinese medicine. I have one that's very Ayurvedic. I have one that is more modern. I have one that's very folk herbalism. Yeah. And I pull from these different mentors to be able to make really informed decisions about the herbs that I'm working with from different sources and then looking at the things that repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. Chamomile is a nervine. It's great for calming those frazzled nerves. 
That is something that traditional Chinese medicine will tell you. Ayurvedic medicine will tell you. Uh, traditional, more modern herbalists will tell you. Yeah. So that is something that you can trust through and through. The other thing in commonality, it's more trustworthy. Yes. Well, and the other thing is test it. Chamomile is not necessarily going to work for me, but it's going to work great for you. Mm. So it is something that is very personal Mm -hmm. and play with it. And don't be afraid to say, this didn't work. Let's try something different. So, but yeah, find a mentor, dig into that community because without that, it's just, you're going to get lost in a sea of information. Well, Jen, I know for my own personal information and maybe some of our viewers who might be interested in doing as well, can you just talk to me a little bit about drying herbs and how to store them? Yeah. So when you dry your herbs, you want to make sure that you are pulling as much of the water content out of the herb as possible because obviously water is a breeding ground for bacteria. So one of the things you don't want to do is you do not want to put partially dried herbs in glass jars or in bags or in oil because you are now introducing water and oil which creates a perfect breeding ground for bacteria which is then going to of course taint your medicine so make sure that they are dried really really well most herbs can go into your dehydrator Mm -hmm. or um, on sunscreens out in your yard or you can put them in your oven door propped open lowest setting and let them dry you want them kind of crispy There are herbs that you do not want to put any heat on when you dry them out. You just want to hang, air dry them. That would be things like comfrey. Mm -hmm. You do not ever want to put heat on comfrey because when you heat comfrey, it actually degrades the medicinal properties of the plant itself. Okay. So now you basically just have a leaf that has very minimal medicinal property. Um, It's good. It's potato chips. Correct. For the goat. Yeah, there you go. For your rabbits. A snack for rabbits. Rabbits and rabbits. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, I'll keep that in mind as we move forward here. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you, you had mentioned you're now a teacher. Yeah. And where can people get more information about your classes in, I mean, I might need it for my own personal use here, but can you give me that information as well? Yeah. So all of our classes are posted on our website. And then you can find us on Instagram at a heritage life farm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'll be looking for that. And I definitely thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm excited to get all of this knowledge out there for other people.